So far in terms of negligent misstatement, we've been looking at a situation where a defendant gives advice uh, to the plaintiff. We're going to change that just a little bit. And we're going to do that by saying, well, what happens for the situation where the defendant actually gives advice to someone else who passes that advice on to the plaintiff? One way to think about this is rather than being a retailer selling to the consumer, it's, it's an, a kind of an analogy to this being the manufacturer of the advice who gives it to the person who uses it. This kind of situation is really one of the one of the kinds of relationships that we often see around financial services, for instance. So what you'll have is a large uh, insurer, and then you will have brokers. So the insurers develop a whole lot of advice about their products in savings and investments and insurance, and those brokers then use that advice with their end clients. So really, the brokers actually don't develop this advice. They pass it on from the insurers. And so the laws become uh, developed around this area to say, look, should these people be liable when it's these people who are actually developing the advice? And if there's carelessness, it, it's going to happen here. So are these people ever going to be liable? And the, the short answer is yes. The test that we've come up with is similar but different to the direct advice. So the first thing we need to note is that it occurs where the defendant gives their client business, gives their client business or serious advice. So again, it's this kind of commercial advice that we're talking about. And really importantly, they know that the person they give the advice to, their client, are going to communicate that advice to someone else. Okay, so back here, we have the third party and we have the client. So if, if, you're, if you're here and you're giving advice to a client and it's of a business or serious nature and you know that they're going to pass it on to a third party, that's what number one means. Second, the advice is likely to lead the third party to enter into a particular kind of transaction. Okay, so... The advice is trying to get this person, the client or plaintiff or third party, is trying to get this person to take out some kind of product, really, you know, in terms of insurance, etc. So they're going to enter a kind of transaction. It's not necessarily a product. That's one way to think about it. It could be to buy a certain kind of house or to negative gear. You know, there could be a whole lot of things here. But if we're thinking about the insurance example, the advice is trying to get them to take some kind of insurance, enter some kind of transaction. So when the advice is likely to lead the third party to enter a transaction and it's likely the third party will suffer this financial loss if the advice is wrong. So notice this test is different. It occurs for when we have um, a, another party here between the, the person who develops the advice and the person who uses it and suffers loss. So this is the particular test that extends owing a duty of care beyond the person who makes the advice to the person who they gave it to those instances where, where it ends up with a third party. Another way to rephrase this is a general rule. As a general rule, someone giving advice won't owe a duty to a third party unless, right, unless they knew or should know that a third party could rely on it. And that ends, for, that ends our four ways of establishing a duty of care. The next little set of videos will actually try and summarize and bring those four duties of care together.